the exclusive master classes of one of the greatest marketing strategies, Jack Trout. We believe that it is high time for us, actually, this year to give presents to all of you instead of having and receiving it. So I won't be talking more. And for the welcome speech, I would like to invite to the stage the president of Azure Cell Telecom and the owner of this idea, Mr. Ali Agan. Please welcome, Mr. Agan. Hi. Hello, all you guys. Uh, since Jack is here, I'm not going to talk too much. I know that we have limited time, so I want you guys to all benefit from him as much as we do. Uh, when I was a student in States, when I first went to States as a student, uh, the first thing that I couldn't understand was the word what's up. You know, I was like, what is this thing? They, they taught me, like, how are you? How do you do? And they, these guys go, like, what's up? So I have to check it out. And the second thing, right after I started my uh, school, I heard the word grew. I mean, they didn't talk taught us what GRU is. I was like, what is GRU? It sounds like something good, but I wasn't so sure. Uh, and today, uh, then I find out what it means. And today, uh, I have the pleasure to meet uh, one of the most well-known, one of the best GRU in his uh, marketing, in the marketing uh, world. So it's Jack Trout. We, as a company, we have been benefiting Jack's uh, wisdom, I should say, know-how through his uh, office in Turkey. Boris has done a great job, as I said, through his enlightenment. Uh, but then we decided that since it's our birthday, and uh, as most of you guys know, in our birthday, we have the tradition of not receiving a birthday present, but giving a birthday present. So we thought that we shouldn't keep him only for ourselves, but also our vendors, our corporate uh, uh, subscribers, our uh, ecosystem would benefit as well. So I would like to thank Jack for uh, accepting our invitation. Welcome to Baku. And uh, I'm going to leave the stage for you. Thank you. Now, the reason that, I, as I said earlier, it's become more important in terms of what I've written about all those years ago is primarily this reason. All the world is becoming a marketing problem today. Uh, and I travel around the globe, and, I'm, and because of the global economy, it has really changed the way the world operates today. And if you, you got, so in a way, if you're going to play in this economy, you have to learn about marketing and strategy. Because it, I call it an ugly fact of life. In this environment, you make a mistake, and your competitors quickly get your business. And what's worse is you rarely get it back. Uh, many companies in the United States, General Motors, people like that, have, have learned this the hard way. You can make mistakes in the old days, but in the new days, you can't because your business goes away. So, in a way, what you're going to see today is learning from the past. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. A famous quote from George Santayana. So, in a way, you can't make mistakes, and the best way to learn is to learn from the past. See what's happened, see what's going on. Now, that's why, as I said, positioning, which began in 1980 and ended recently with my, with my last book on positioning called Repositioning 2009, is probably more important today than it was when I first started to write about the subject. Because positioning is the tool to use it's the essence of the strategy that you must employ to deal with global competition, both ho at home and abroad. It's the starting point for your planning and your marketing. So that's why, as I say, this is now a very important tool. Internet, okay. This is, again, I get this question a lot. How do we deal with the, this brave new world, the internet? This is a tool to use to tell your positioning story. But it has some problems. It is not a good interruptive media. People resist being sold while online. So the internet is a medium which is still a work in progress. It's not the answer uh, yet, because a lot of companies are still trying to sort out how do we use this medium. 
Let's get the clearest definition of positioning, because a lot of people hear the word, but they don't, can't define it. It's how you differentiate your product in the mind of the prospect. That's really, it's that simple. How do I get into the mind and separate myself from the competition? And repositioning, my latest book, is how to adjust perceptions in the mind of the prospect. So into the mind, and because of the current environment and what's going on, sometimes you have to do some adjusting in the mind. So, in a way, it's all about finding your point of difference, which is really what Differentiated Die was all about, one of my later books, many years after the first book. It's, it's how do you separate yourself? What makes you different is the essence of successful marketing today. And in a, in a, in a very growingly competitive world, that point of difference is becoming more important. So let's talk about different ways to separate yourself. Let's start with price. Now, a Roman wrote very accurately. He said, a thing is worth whatever the buyer will pay for it. Good definition of price. But just to set, try to sell on price alone, it's a trap. And the reason it's a trap is because of this pencil. And the reason that pencil is there is because your competitors, they can write down they're, they can lower their price as fast as you lower it. So in other words, price alone is, is hard to differentiate yourself around because people have pencils. They can mark down. If you want to mark down, I'll mark down. So price is very tricky. Let's talk about a, what I consider an airline that has been built on value or price, but it's, it's really a simple success story. And it's probably the most successful airline in our country called Southwest. Now, if you talk to the founder, who I know, Herb Kelleher, and he would say, no, no, even though we sell at a very good price, we're not a price airline. We're different. Then you ask Herb, well, how are you different? And he'll say, well, we only have one kind of airplane. It's all we fly. And essentially, why do we do that? because we can keep our maintenance costs down, our training costs down. Having a lot of different airplanes is expensive. He said, we have no bad food or lousy food. In fact, we have no food at all on the airplane. What you save on Southwest, he said, you can uh, spend at a gourmet restaurant when you arrive. No loading of food, he keeps my costs down. He said, we have no assigned seats, just reusable boarding passes, no groping for seats, no boarding early. No overbooking. Walk on, plane takes off, you arrive on time. Reservation systems are expensive. And he said, we don't go through hubs. In America, we have these hubs. Planes fly direct to where you want to go, not where we want you to change planes. And flying the shortest distance between two points saves fuel, time, so the airplane charges less. So what he has done, he has built a structure which essentially has a, it costs less to run. So he has created a different kind of airline, but he also does another thing. From a service point of view, he does keep things funny because flying on this airplane is like flying, as we say in America, like a cattle car. They jam you on, they jam you off. But the stewardesses do stand-up comedy, pilots do stand-up comedy, so they make the experience much more enjoyable uh, in, in, a, in really almost an airline that runs like a bus. So, here's my message to you. In terms of price, a thing is worth whatever the buyer will pay for your point of difference. I think that's a much more accurate way to go. What will people pay to get the difference that I offer? That's how you should view price. All right, another way of going is, can I have better service? Customer service, uh, is that a differentiator? Um, there's a big department store in America called Nordstrom, and that, they have built their brand around better service, big department store. And, but to do that, they have created a service philosophy. This is what they give to their new employees. They say, welcome to Nordstrom. 
We're glad, you, we're glad you, to have you with our company. Our number one goal is to provide outstanding customer service. Set your, your goals high. Will you have great confidence in your ability to achieve them? And here are the Nordstrom rules. Rule number one, use your good judgment in all situations. There will be no additional rules. Interesting. And they have a company structure which is upside down. They say, no, no, we start with the customers, and then we, then we move down to the board of directors. So in a way, they say we are focused on the customers, not on the board or, 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 or the, uh, or the uh, different players in, in the management. So in a way, they have built this thing. Now, uh, be aware, this costs money to build this kind of a customer service. There's investments involved. Now, what you can do, you can also get into what we call the customer reinforcement game, which is a, a book called Enterprise One on One to One is pretty good in that it, once you have a customer, how do I handle them? How do I reinforce them? How do I serve them? It's a lot more expensive to get a customer than it is to keep a customer. So in a way, the strategy is to track them and then you essentially try to hang on to them. So, Here's my view of the customer game. It's not about knowing your customer. It's about your customer knowing what makes you different. That's the, and if it's going to be better service, that's what you've got to be about. Another reason, way to say this is, is to supply a reason to buy. In other words, what is, what is the deal here? Why should I, you know, why should I come to you? Now, if you go through magazines, and I just went through these things, what you have to be careful of is stuff like this. This is, I'd say, are these reasons to buy? And you have stuff like start something, welcome aboard, really, people drive us, expanding possibilities, changing the world with great care. What are you looking at? You have to get away from what I call meaningless slogans. Meaningless slogans are not good strategy. I'll take, I'll take you through a few. Nike, most famous slogan is just do it. Now, is it a slogan or is it a, it's a slogan. It's not a point of difference. If you wanted to, if I wanted to describe you what makes Nike different, here it is. It's what the world's best athletes wear. Now, how do they do that? They spend millions of dollars buying the best athletes in the world and putting a swish on them. And so when you see Roger Federer with a swish and Nadal with a swish, you know that obviously they are wearing, they're the best athletes in the world and they're wearing Nike. Nokia, phones, okay, connecting people. I met with the CEO, he's now been, not anymore, but I said to him, I said, connecting people is not a differentiating idea. I mean, what else are you connecting? You're not connecting animals. So, uh, so I said, I'll tell you what, you're, you're, what you should say about yourself. You should say we're the world's number one cell phone, which they are, they still are, even though the smartphone is giving them a lot of difficulties. But again, leadership, that's what makes them different. New Zealand, anybody, any, the world's newest country. Now that is a silly idea. Why do I want to go to a new country? I want to go to an old country. In fact, the older, the better. Uh, but if you go to New Zealand, what they should be saying about themselves is pretty obvious. The two most beautiful islands in the world. And it's exactly true. Physical beauty is really the strategy that they should be, they should be selling. So, and, and that's an attribute. So let's start with one way to separate yourself is by attribute. Physical beauty is, is an attribute. Uh, here's, what the psych, here's what the psychology people say. Every person, mixture of characteristics. Being known for one characteristic makes that person unique. Einstein, intelligent. Mal Monroe, sexy. All right? Same goes for products. A product is a mixture of characteristics. Being known for one makes that product unique. Volvo built their brand around safety. Crest is a toothpaste in the United States built around cavity prevention. Um, New Zealand, physical beauty. Visa, 
built their brand around the simple idea of everywhere. You can use a Visa card anywhere in the world. And that's a very good attribute for a credit card. Automobile brands, the most successful brands, are built around actually attributes. BMW, driving, ultimate driving machine. Volvo built their brand around safety. Mercedes, really prestige and engineering, actually. Toyota had around reliability until recently they've had some problems with their reliability idea. Jaguar's old been about styling, and I think they're muck, mucking up the styling of Jaguar right now. And Ferrari's all been about speed. So in other words, the, the, the biggest brands sometimes tend to own an attribute. Now, there's the thing, but there's a law of, of exclusivity. It's what I call the sixth immutable law of marketing. Two companies cannot own the same attribute in the mind. If, if an attribute is gone, you can't use it. Because what you're doing is you're helping the guy who owns it. You're making life better for him. Um, let's talk about Volvo. Volvo built it around the attribute of safety. Fine. Very successful. Um, but safety became very popular suddenly, primarily because of Volvo. So here's a whole bunch of ads. Here's, here's Chrysler talking about we got ahead by playing it safe. So it's Chrysler jumps on the safety idea. BMW even tried it. You know, measuring car safety. BMW. Mistake. You know, you don't take some, try to take somebody else's attribute. And here's GM saying safety isn't, it's, it's everything. But again, this helps Volvo more than it helps General Motors. See, and, and, and one of the problems is, is, I call it an inconsistency, the problem is how their cars look. There's only one car that was really looks like a tank, and it was uh, Volvo. So in other words, when you own something, sometimes what you look, how you handle yourself, is part of the story. Uh, but of course, what, what did they do next? They started to drive the wrong way. They did convertibles. Now, if you own safety and you have a kind of a tanky looking car, you don't want to do convertibles because they're not safe. And B, they can't look tanky. Uh, you have to change the styling. So in a way, you undermine the position that you've built. Another thing you have to remember is use it or lose it. Once you stop focusing on your attribute, you run the risk of becoming nothing. And that is a big problem, gigantic problem, where people sort of, well, I'm going to become something else, or I'm going to become everything for everybody. And then you have a big, big problem. Here's a brand of toothpaste that once had 10% of the market, which is a big, big share, called AIM. What did they do? They used an attribute, good taste. The good tasting toothpaste. And then how'd they sell it? Well, they went, to their, they went to the market and they said to the parents, they said, you should get this toothpaste because it has such a good taste that your children will brush their teeth more. Wow. So the parents said, good idea. And they went off to essentially buy game. But then what happened? Well, the marketing experts say, oh, well, no. What about other, other products? So why don't, we, uh, why don't we get into extra strength, and maybe we'll have uh, anti-cavity, and then we'll have, uh, and we'll even, change the, we'll even change the taste. We'll have mint gel. Well, you lose focus. In other words, you stop, you're not using it. So you're losing it. So what happened? Now it's now 0.8 share. It just fell apart because they, what they had, they decided they were going to become something else or confuse people. You can see things working out in retail this way. The world of, you take, for example, Walmart built the brand around everyday low prices, probably the largest, most successful retailer in the world. But they were under a certain amount of pressure to on individual prices, they weren't always the lowest. So what did they do? They, they essentially, they didn't have low price on an item by item basis. So their advantage overall was low price on a number of items. So they, sent, they, they sort of repositioned themselves around total value, which was save money, live better. So there they, there's a good example of adjusting or changing perceptions a little bit. In, other words, in total, you'll save money. 
Don't focus on an item by item. Interesting story in the, out of the supermarket world. Stop and Shop is a big retail food store in, a, in the northeast part of the United States. And essentially, I was involved with them, and they had to differentiate them from their competitors. And, but they wanted to say, we offer you a very good deal without screaming low price. And also, they wanted to reinforce their quality attributes. So the concept that we ran with, which was a, an attribute, honest values. In other words, this is really what we're all about. And then we went on to talk about a value story. Better care in shipping produce, fish brought straight from a dock, high quality standards that they're in their private labels. Good marketing is good storytelling. And this was the story, and essentially, Honest values are what we are all about. That became their concept, and, they, and, they, and the platform that they told it from, we said, interesting thought, what makes a difference is not what goes on the shelves, it's what goes on behind the shelves. The things that we do to give you the kind of value we think you deserve. So that really became it, and that, that concept really turned them around. And that idea was worth $2.9 billion, which is what a company, Euro European company, bought them for. They essentially stepped up and said, we would like, and, and that's what, that was the end of the story. They got sold for $2.9 billion. But as I said, slogans are not differentiating ideas. Banks are the worst sloganeers in the business. I mean, I, and, and these are all true stories. Where money lives. Where money lives? What do we feed it? I don't know. Embracing ingenuity. What does that mean? I have no idea. The clean Swiss bank. I did not know there was a dirty Swiss bank. Then they, I've seen the power to do more. More of what? How about more interest? No, 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 no. We're not going to do that for you. Whatever makes you happy. More interest. No. Sorry, that's not it. And here's my favorite. Here today, here tomorrow. <laughs> I would hope so. You have my money. So in a way, this is what the banking world uh, has gotten into. And the, uh, here's the result. I did, we did a lot of, a, a company I know that, who does a lot of research on, on uh, loyalty said they discovered that the banking sector had 0% differentiation. Zero. And why? Meaningless slogans, endless mergers have commoditized the category. That is really what has happened in the banking sector. Uh, another way to go is differentiating yourself on how it's made or, or what I do as a service or how I make a product. Um, here's the psychology. Consumers want to believe that products contain a magic ingredient which will improve performance. Understanding how the ingredient works is not essential. And let me give you some interesting examples. Crest, this cavity prevention, they had fluoristan. That's the magic that prevented categories. Nobody understood well how it worked, but you know, it was less cavities. For years, Sony had a thing called Trinitron. I, net, I, net, I, I, I've only, I think found one person in, a, you know, in years that understood what Trinitron was. We said, what's Trinitron? I don't know but they have a nice picture. Oh, well, that's good. Um, Cadillac, big car in America, started with a thing called a North Star engine. Now, I don't understand that either. And, and you say this to me, well, how does this work? Well, you want to drive this car north. It's terrific. How about south? It's average south. It's a, north, it's a car you want to drive north. Chrysler came up with the Hemi engine, which is, again, another interesting idea. Uh, nobody understood it, but it, it sounded good. I did a lot of work for a pizza chain in this concept of how it's made. And it's an interesting story. It's a story of a company called Papa John's, who says little guys cannot beat big guys. This is, a, 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 this is now the number three player in the, in the industry. But he came from out of nowhere. And he, was, he essentially showed up in my office one day. And 
I said, John, why are you so successful? You're doing quite well out there. He said, well, I, I do a lot of things. I said, well, what do you do? Well, he started going down the list. And I was sort of, didn't say anything of great interest to me. And then suddenly he said, I have Dino's sauce. Now, you don't know who Dino is, but uh, Dino Cotopassi is a gentleman that makes all the sauce for the mom and pop pizzerias in America. These independents, we call them. And he makes it and he puts it in cans, fresh packs it, and ships it around. The big players, the pizza huts of this world, Domino's, what they do is they get their sauce uh, in big containers and they add water. It, it, they reconstitute it. Uh, they remanufacture it. John essentially pretty much did it, you know, by using fresh sauce. And that, so I said, well, now that's an interesting idea because you don't make your sauce from concentrate, which means it's a better tasting sauce. And, and, and that really became the basis for this simple position. Better ingredients, better peace. And John's been running with that idea for years now. Uh, and it was amazing because it was his decision to go for it. You know, I presented this, re this positioning strategy. He listened to his marketing people argue. And then he says, does anybody here have a better idea? They said, no. And he said, he said okay, then it's off we go. And that's exactly how this idea was born. And, uh, and to John's credit, off he went. And as a result, he got some excellent publicity. Popular Peach's gimmick is taste um, some, and some better results. He, was, he started to grow at twice the industry average. Profits were up. Stock prices has done very well over the years. Same story was interesting. It's a catch-up story, how it's made. This was, this was down in Venezuela. The, the catch-up in Venezuela was a, a product called Pampero. And I was asked down to sort of help them differentiate this ketchup. The reason? Two big brands from America were coming to Venezuela. Heinz and Del Monte was now going to be up against Pompero. And I looked at these three and I said, uh, you know, you can't see it from the slide because there's a little bit too much light. Um, I said, how come your ketchup is a little redder than the other ketchup? It seems to be a slightly different color. And they said to me, well, the big brands, here's what, they take tomatoes and they mash them all up, turn them into ketchup. I said, okay. I said, what do you do? Well, we don't mash them initially. I said, well, what do you do? Well, we take the skins off before we mash them up. I said, you're kidding. Oh, yeah, we have, we just, we, we, we think it's much better to take the skins off. When I heard that, I said, hey, now that's a good idea. And the reason it's a good idea is because you take recipes and they use, you know, they use whole tomatoes. They, they, they often call for removing the skin. And I said, you should exploit the fact that, you know, without the skin perception of quality and taste. That's your point of difference. You know, you should talk about that. And they said, well, that's a good idea, but we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? Well, we just bought the same machines. We're going to do it the other way. I said, send the machines back. You're going to lose your point of difference. Well, with that, I left town. So I, yeah, that was it. Here's my, one of my favorites. Fewer leaks. This is a leak-proof casket. This is the science behind our unique new warranty. This is a company called Batesville. They are the numbest, number one uh, casket. And, it, and it's a great slogan. The biggest should do more. It's only right. Very good idea. And I said, but a leak-proof casket? Oh, yeah. Well... It was, it was funny because uh, who, who, who buys these things? Well, people who are alive. The people who are dead, they don't care about the leaking. But it, it's, it's so interesting. Here's the duck's bed. More comfort for your back and for your shoulders. Again, the way they make it, whatnot, very good strategy. Fresher taste came with Tropicana and, you know, pure premium. And that was, again, the the how it's made strategy. And I like this one. Kettle One built their brand around handmade vodka. Handmade. My view is, would you please keep your hands out of my vodka? But this worked very well for them. All right, let's, let's say we can't do the, 
we can't do the uh, attribute or, or maybe how it's made, but how about being first? And that's another very powerful differentiating idea. How come? Well, people tend to stick with what they've got. We call this, it's a, it's a mag status quo is a magnetic attraction. Psychologists say it's keeping on, keeping on is what they say about this. The first gourmet mustard. In other words, we had yellow mustard in America, and then suddenly Grey Poupon showed up with Dijon mustard, and it was a wild success. We had a lot of daytime coal remedies, and in comes NyQuil with a nighttime coal remedy. The first nighttime, big success. First flu remedy. We again had no, no, no flu, and we had Theraflu suddenly with powder into water. So another very big success. And, it, and the, there was salad, but not packaged. And suddenly, f you had Fresh Express. And it's under, they had the pioneer in packaged salads. In other words, they talked about being first. Bagged at Breeze, sort of, a, sort of an interesting how it's made strategy. And we have a natural dog food, which I think is kind of nature's course. Why, why give your dog, you know, give him natural dog food. America has a thing about dogs. And we have an organic baby food for, hey, Earth's best baby food, grown without pesticides. Nice concept. Nice concept. First shaving gel in America was a product called Edge. It's a gel. A lot of creams, but suddenly we had a gel. And this is now the number one brand in America. And I think even though it turns into a cream, the gel idea was a first. And of course, we have the first global coffee house, Starbucks, a gigantic success. And of course, the first search engine, Google. Two almost generic brands. I'm going to go to Starbucks, I'm going to Google it. Powerful brands. Interestingly, we even have a natural and organic, Whole Foods has got a nice concept, natural and organic foods, a first. Here's another first, but it's an old first. Dom Perignon Champagne was the first champagne. It is still a gigantically successful brand. Paid a lot of money, comes in a green box. And so in a way, they have maintained what that brand was, even though it's been decades upon decades. Now here's, here's a first I don't like too much. The first ice cream for dogs. It's not ice cream, but your dog will think it is. What does my dog know about ice cream? I have no idea, but that's... And if you think that's silly, how about this one? It's the first video for dogs. It's called Doggy Adventure, and it's at last, it's a video for your dog to watch, shot from a dog's point of view about three feet in the air. I mean, this is really silly stuff. And yet, you know, people who are nutty about their dogs will, will buy this stuff. Um, I showed this in, in China. They, they laugh. I said, well, what's so funny? Well, in China, we eat the dogs. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you the power of being first. Here's 25 product categories, from bacon to toothpaste and everything in the middle. All right? Now, let's go back to 1923. Here are the lead brands in all those categories. Now, you'll recognize the names if you hang around America, they're all pretty much, here's the lead brands today. Essentially, the same cast of characters, with the exception of only five, have lost their leadership. Everready's now replaced by Duracell, Kellogg's is now Cheerios, but they're still there. It's, since 1923, these five, these brands have dominated every, all these categories. It shows you it talks about keeping on, keeping on, believe me. So being first can be an enormous asset. Now, if you can't be first, how about being the latest? The next generation is a very powerful idea. Why is that? Here's the psychology. When it comes to products, our society has trained us to look for the newest and the latest. People are not comfortable buying with what could be perceived as an obsolete product. It's amazing how we're sort of, okay, what's the new stuff? Um, here is the classic product called Advil, pain reliever, advanced medicine for pain. Right off the name, Advil Advanced. Now, but here's the brilliance that made this product so successful. 
they did this. They showed you that Ashburn was born in 1899. I had no idea about that. Tylenol came into the world in 1955, and Advil's today. In other words, they dramatized and showed you how new they were and how old the other pain relievers were. And that was the key to driving them really into, really, it's a two-horse race now. It's a Tylenol at 22 share and an Advil at about 14 share from out of nowhere. And everybody else is, is kind of nowhere. So in a way, that being the latest and then dramatizing how, how, how old the other ones were was a very big, big move. Leadership. Now, I love leadership. It's a very powerful, very powerful differentiator. Now, why is that? Well, humans tend to equate bigness with success and social status. Leadership is the most direct way to establish the credentials of your brand. And credentials are the collateral you put up to guarantee your performance. If you're the leader, make sure everybody knows you're the leader, which is why I told Nokia that they should establish themselves as the world's number one cell phone. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a leadership idea. And McDonald's is what, you know, what the world's favorite place to eat is, a leadership idea. My favorite right now is Titleist. Golf ball, right? The number one ball in golf. Terrific. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's what they should stay, stay with and, and not, never change. Here's an interesting story from Brazil. Brahma was the number two beer behind Antarctica, okay? So, and, that, and so they were, they were challenging on it, but they were number two, decided number two. So then what happened? One day, Brahma says, okay, we're gonna start talking about cerveza number one. They started to talk about leadership. And essentially they said, we're the leader. And they even had a point of purchase thing which, which, with the number one idea. Now, the truth of the matter is they were lying. It was close, but they were not the leader. But people saw that and they say, well, I'm drinking the wrong beer. I should be drinking the number one beer. And they switched. And sure enough, Brahma is now number one. And essentially, now you might say, well, that was unfair, but hey, it shows you that somebody who was drinking number two said, oh no, I gotta be drinking number one beer. And that, enough people switched to put them back into first place. Now there's a happy ending. They merged, so now they're all, they're all number one now. So they bought each other, so it's a happy ending. But at the moment, it was a classic example of the power of being the leader. I did some work uh, in Austria uh, for a company called Lenzi. And uh, interesting, interesting story. They're in what we call the viscose business. In America, we call it rayon. It's a fiber. And they had a whole bunch of brands. They had Visco, Discover, Modal, Lysol. They, they had a family of brands. And uh, here was their problem. Global economy. And, I, and as I said earlier, if you don't have a positioning idea to differentiate your company, you better have a great price. And this is Austria. So they're not in the price game. They couldn't do it. So what did they do? Well, here was the, the current strategy, they were, what they were using was a, a, what I call a fashion, high fashion show. They had a famous model and they were talking about their different brands and, and a day in the life of Naomi, who was the name of the model. You know, it was a fashion thing. And I said to the president, I said, you know, high fashion is not gonna, is that, it, that, that to me is not a good idea. I said, what, I, what else we got? And they said, well, I said, this fashion made no sense. The important attributes in buying for their stuff was quality, delivery, and technical support. And you scored very well when it came to technology. And I looked at the, the research, and what I discovered that it, when it came to these perceptions, they had, if you look at their competition versus lensing, you'll discover that you know, essentially the competition was here and lensing was, had much higher marks in perceptions on productivity, but technical quality and technical support, enormous leverage on technical support and technical quality. Now, if you're getting into, the, if you're buying a fiber, these are very important attributes. And I said, how did you get those perceptions? They would say, well, we have, an, we have great 
credentials in technology. I said, oh, is that right? And they took me through the years, all the way back to 30, where the things that they had invented, whether it was flame retardants, thinner, chlorine-free, high strength. So I said, well, now that is a terrific foundation for a very simple idea. The world's leader in viscose fiber technology. You can be the leader in a lot of things, either in sales, but if you're a leader in technology, that's a very big plus in that business. And essentially, so that was, became their direction. Focus on leadership in technology, and then bring that idea to life across all of your marketing activities. No, and here are some prototypes I do. It's a fiber that gets better. These are all the things we invented. We've been using technology. We're a leader in viscose technology. This is, again, their, their communications, how they go out and sell the story. Here's one of their products, viscose XS, stretches the limits. It's designed for high-speed machines. Another product was uh, Modal. It's a, it's a blending product. Makes other fibers better fibers. And essentially, again, it's a, it's a technology story. Their fanciest fiber was Lyocell, softness, making the world a softer place. Again, leadership. Every different one of their brands was, was sort of became part of the story. And here's one of their non-wovens, high purity viscose fibers. Again, this is essentially a, a new fiber for hygienic products. So basically it was, a, uh, it was taking, take, take it all together and put it under the umbrella of technology. And essentially, they're now the world's leader in cellulose fibers. And their revenues over the eight years, you know, 240%, and they dominate the newest generation of cellulose fibers. So taking that technology positioning strategy turned them into a very successful operation. Another interesting story I was involved with was is Spanish olive oil. And interestingly enough, if you look at world olive oil production, you might not know this, but Spain produces 45% of the world's olive oil. Number two is Italy at 21, half, Greece down to 11, and then nobody else. Now, that's an impressive number, but here's the problem. Spain is the dominant leader in olive oil production, but Italy is, is perceived of as king. Spain makes most of the oil, Italy makes most of the money. Why is that? Where do you think Italy gets their olive oil from? From Spain. Then what do they do? They put it in their cans and bottles and sell it as theirs. So that was what was happening. So I said to the olive oil people, I said, look, you have to fix that. How do you fix that? Well, step one, positioning. Position Spain as the world's number one producer of olive oil. Nobody knows that. Build that perception. But there's another problem. What do we do with Italy? They're a big customer. We can't say they're lying. So we gotta do something. So here's what we do. Dramatization. 2,000 years ago, the Romans were our best customers. Today, they still are. The Romans know good olive oil when they taste it. And that's how you get around, you know, you don't insult them, but you say, hey, you, you, you know, it, Italy, Knows good. That's why they buy so much of our olive oil. They're our best customers. Nice strategy. But that's only part two. Part three, how do I identify it? Develop a symbol or a seal that enables customers to identify olive oil from Spain. You know, something like this. 100% olive oil from Spain. And then you put this little seal on, uh, on all of your cans and your bottles. That's what you do. It's a, it's a multi-stage strategy. Leadership, deal with Italy, identify your product. Russia. Russia's not an easy place to do business, but some years ago we did a little work for a, a, a jewelry store in Russia, and here was the strategy. Ad Adamus, the leader in Russian jewelry. It was a leadership strategy. They were fine Russian jewelry was what they were all about. And very simple concept, I developed, you know, why, sh why do more people shop at the store? You tell the reason, it's, you know, and, and the reason is essentially it's some of the things we do to make sure it's, it's, main, it's the finest you can buy. 
Can the jewelry's jaw be a sign of love? No, like, hey, if you have, it's like the Tiffany's blue box, same thing. If, if, if somebody is buying a jewelry from this store, it's a sign of the, how much they love it. Good, good, so they, they did that. And here's what happened. And by 2009, they, their volume had grown 10%, profits up 20, and while the jewelry category dropped. People buy where other people buy. So in a way, that was a, executing the, the leadership idea. All right, let's uh, do another way to do it, heritage. Is there a, if you have a strong history, that can be a very big advantage. Again, the psychology. Behaviors say that without a line from the past, sometimes it's difficult to believe in a line to the future. Merged companies have their heritage swallowed up, their customers feel abandoned. Believe me, it's, it's, if you have a heritage, you use it sometimes as a differentiator. Coke had the real thing. That's a heritage idea. We invented it, the real thing. They never should have dropped this idea. It was a big, big mistake. What they did is replace their heritage concept with meaningless slogans. Red, white, and you? What kind of a nutty idea is that? Red, white, and you. How about catch the wave? This is the new code, right, which went away, as you all know. The real choice, we have a new one and, a, and an old one. Makes no sense. Or you can't beat the feeling. What, is, what does a Coke feel like other than being sticky? I, I have no idea what a Coke feels like. And how about we've got a taste feel? Well, again, from the real thing, they, they headed off in all these crazy directions. And then, always Coca-Cola. What do you mean, always? What about PepsiCo? They're out there. It's not always. Let's go back to Ru Russia, which is kind of interesting. Um, Russia, the market leader in Russia is a product called Aqua Mineral. That's the number one uh, Russian brand of water. And essentially, what Aqua Mineral had in Russia was good marketing. They positioned it they exploited the, the, the perception that good water must be mineral water. It's in their name, aqua mineral. And they disguised its origin while making believe that it comes from the mountains. Mountains are on their label. That's very true. They had aqua mineral and all these mountains. Well, the market original, Bojomi was essentially, was a true mountain water. What they should have advertised, this is Narzan, is advertising, repositioned aqua mineral as not being real mountain water, only make-believe mountain water. And the real mountain water is best. And, and that's, this is what they should have said. You can't spot the real mountain water by the label. And, and, and it's, um, Narzan, Russia's original mountain water. This water is produced nowhere near the mountains. This comes from mountains where nature produces the best water. It's using your heritage, but also repositioning your competition as being really not real. Sometimes you can do heritage with a family strategy, which can be very effective. Here's the, his Dino's sauce, right? Meet the rest of the family, the real Italian tomato team behind them. This was really the, the sauce that John used, and this was the gentleman that made the sauce. Here's another interesting family. Why we plan on staying a family company. In today's competitive world, a, fa a family company is better positioned to serve its customers. And essentially, we're not into stockholders, we're really into our customers, and you know, we're, we're, we're not into earnings as much as innovations, and we, don't, we customize, we don't standardize. So you can use family as a, as a heritage strategy. Now, countries have heritage based on what they've sold over the years, okay? Um, United States is famous for their computers, their technology, and, and airplanes. Uh, that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we have. Japan is famous for their automobiles and their electronics. Um, Germany is engineering and beer. Strong, you know, they engineer in the morning and they drink beer in the afternoon. Uh, Switzerland is banking and watches. That's what they're known for. So they have powerful heritage strategies. 
France is wine, perfume. Spain, resort country of Europe, their beaches. Now, let's talk about a resort problem that I've been involved with in recently in Spain. In other words, they have that perception, but there's a problem. What's the problem? The, the dominant vacation position in Europe is being challenged by other Mediterranean destinations that have sun and beaches and lower prices. So how do they reposition themselves to counter the new competition that they have? And this is especially true in the euro, which gotten pretty expensive. So, you know, interestingly enough, if you look at their tourism history, and this happens a lot in tourism advertising, they suffer from changing slogans. Everything under the sun was the first idea. Now that's a good idea. Everything new under the sun, well, now we're getting confusing. Then they said, no, we have a passion for life. What does that mean? Bravo, Spain. Spain marks. Smile, you are in Spain, and I need Spain. Now, what's going on here? This happens in tourism a lot. Why? You have a good idea, and then what happens? Well, we get, we get re elections, and a new government shows up. They want their own idea. So nobody stays with anything. They constantly, what's my idea? What's my idea? So that's what goes on. And now they were down to, I need Spain. And, and, and I was arguing with the tourism people. I said, now wait a minute. What does that mean, I need Spain? This is like uh, Turkish Airlines, you know, globally yours. What does that mean? I don't get it. And so, uh, so I said, what's going on here? Well, it's lifestyle. I said, what do you mean lifestyle? Well, you know, everybody likes, so you need Spain to come down here for our lifestyle. I said, you want lifestyle? Go to Australia. They got great lifestyle. So I said, no, what you should do, and what has stuck, Spain's climate and beaches made them Europe's va favorite vacation, number two in visits. But the sun has outshone things to see. I said, if Spain is everything under the sun, you should spend more effort on everything. What they've done is they, the sun got all the, 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 the excitement and they didn't talk about what else was down there. So I said, what you should do is go back to the future. Bring back the only good slogan or concept you had, everything under the sun. Bring it back. But this time, you talk about not just the beaches, but you talk about everything. Some of the cathedrals of, his, uh, of historic Spain. Talk about, people love to go see uh, castles. This is castles. People love to go see cathedrals of religious Spain. Fine, show them that. And you don't have to ignore sun here. Some of the beaches of the sun-drenched Spain. So again, how do you bring, A, the right strategy, and then how do you bring it to life? That's really what you have to do about. So, so that's... Again, tourism is it's not, it's not complicated. Italy, design and clothing is about Italy. Now here's, here's, here's an interesting story, Zara. Zara is a, one of the most successful retailers in the, in the world right now, but it's Spain's high fashion for less company. And it's a name that sounds like an Italian company, Zara. It's probably one of the keys to their success. Don't ever let people know that you're from Spain. Let people know you're from Italy. That's what, because that's your known for design there. You know, st be careful. You're, as far as I'm concerned, you know, make believe you're an Italian company. And, and that is the key to their success because they're coming off of that perception that Italy has. The United Kingdom has some problems right now. All I'm known for is royalty and racing cars and that's about it. And, and so the, in a way, that, and they can't really franchise the royalty part, that would be nice, but um, China, the world's workshop. They make everything, uh, and they're good at it. But, you know, that's, that's what they are. But that's a problem. They recognize the need to move up the food chain and begin to build brands. To do this, they must now move from manufacturing to marketing. 
And what they have done is they have adopted positioning as the way to do this. And when China adopts something, they're amazing. They're amazing. Um, and let me show you what's happening. I went to Beijing to celebrate the 40th anniversary of positioning, to Beijing. And I was introduced to their new positioning training school and their graduating management that will use positioning principles to build brands. I couldn't imagine. The only positioning training schools in the world are in China. And he was the first class. Companies of the first class, here's the second class, more and more companies. So they're training the entrepreneurs to do positioning. And I think that's a big difference. China is going to learn this stuff and they're going to do it well. I get people in America and people in, in, in Europe, they use the word but they don't really understand it very well. They haven't been trained in it. But here's the best. I, I signed an agreement with China's Harvard, Peking University. I signed an agreement and essentially they're putting in a strategic positioning program into their, their Harvard. They are actually now teaching positioning in their premier school in China. And what's even more interesting is they got rights to all of my books. One guy got the rights to all of my books and then what did he do? He published Trout in a Box. Every book of mine now is in a box in China, a whole set of books, which is simplicity and obvious and differentiation and all the, all the things. It shows you how committed they are to getting good at this marketing business. And I think, so I mean in a way, it just shows you that uh, if, you, if you work hard at and understanding it, and I think they're gonna build some pretty good brands in the future. Argentina, what are they known for? Beef and leather. Now, interesting story. It's called the Repositioning and Argentinian Technology Company, okay? Barcodes. All the world is, is now dominated by barcodes. Now, how do you read barcodes? Well, there's a company in Argentina called, at the time was called Computata. They were developing the, the, a family of barcode reading machines, high tech. And that's what they were doing and they were becoming successful. And this guy came into my office some years ago and he said, uh, we have a, you know, we're trying to build a, a much stronger global presence and uh, we think we have some problems. And I said, what, well, he said, we have some branding confusion between our corporate name, CompuData, and our product name, Multiscan. And then we do have the made in Argentina problems of technology perceptions. People say, well, where are you from? Well, we're from Argentina. Well, how can you be, how can you be good at technology and come from Argentina? So that was a problem. So in studying it, I, I said, well, look, number one, um, here is what I, here's what I recommend. Let's take Multiscan. Take your product name and make that the corporate name. Multiscan. And let's position you around leadership because you now are the world's leader in laser barcode document reading. This was a relatively new thing and I said jump on, on laser barcode reading where you have some leadership and that's what you should do. And one other issue. Can you headquarter in the USA? We said do you have an office? Yeah, we have one in Miami. It's your new headquarters, Miami. Guy said, you're kidding. Yes. So let me show you what this guy was willing to do. His, here was his business card that he showed up with. CompuData SA, Roberto Martinez Taylor, Presidente, La Plata in Argentina. I said, now, R Roberto, we're going to make a few changes. We're gonna, you're going to go to become multi-scan. We're going to put your leadership idea, world leader in laser barcode document reading up there. And if you don't mind, Roberto, we're going to change your address to Miami, Florida. He said, okay, all right, I'll do it. And he said, now we got one more thing we want you to change. He said, well, my God, I've just changed the name of the company, where I'm from. I said, Roberto, we don't particularly like your name. I said, my name? He said, yep, do you mind if we turn you into Robert M. Taylor? Chairman, Multiscan, and Miami, Florida. 
Now I think you're ready to go global. And here he goes. Off he goes. He, his, he's increased his sales 10 times. He now exports 60% of his products. He's selling in 55 countries. And he did that because he was willing to make the changes to sort of reposition himself totally differently. So, four steps. Four steps to differentiation. If you're going to get into this business, here's what you do. Number one, arguments are never made in a vacuum. There's always com competitors trying to make points of their own. Believe me, it's a difficult competitive world and it will get even more difficult. And your message has to make sense in the context of the category. What's your story? You know, how do you shape your story? Secondly, that should lead to a differentiating idea. You're looking for something that separates you from your competitors. The trick is to find it and then set up as a benefit for your customer. In other words, and you've seen many examples of, of, examples of how to do that. Next up, you need credentials. To build a logical argument for your difference, you, you have to have the credentials to support your claim of being different. You saw that with lensing. They had all that history of technology. Um, you, you, so in a way, and sometimes you have to change your, where you come from as a credential, and that was the, that was the USA uh, multi, multi scan. You have to be able to demonstrate your point of difference. You have to have a story. Good marketing is good storytelling. And then finally, you have to communicate the difference. You know, if you build a, a differentiated product, the world will not automatically be the path to your door. Truth will not win without some help. So every aspect of your communication should reflect that point of difference. So those are the, the, the four relatively simple steps. So in a way, that's, you know, that, is, that is the message that I'm delivering today. It's, it's all about being different, and it's all about building a story around your brand and what you stand for, and it's a willingness to make the changes that would make this thing all happen. So before this, so now that we're, we're out of here, okay, any questions? Let's, uh, that's my formal part, so now you have a... So if there are questions, we have microphones, just raise your hand, please. Yeah. And please introduce yourself first, the, the company you work for, and then ask your question. Elvin Nasibov from Marketing Azershel. Uh, Mr. Trout, uh, high quality products has to be uh, expensive. That's the perception. What happens if the price for those high quality products drop down? Would that hurt their positioning or perception about them? Uh, that's a good Thank question. You. In other words, um, if, if you start to reduce your price, you will begin to undermine that perceived value. That's your, your, your prestige, so to speak. I would, um, for example, let's take, a, let's take a Rolex now. Rolex is a very expensive watch. So, but in this economy, people bought a Rolex watch to impress their friends and their neighbors. It was a status buy. Hey, I got a Rolex. I made you know, $10,000 for this watch. But in this environment, I think you have to adjust your message a little bit because of you have to add value to it as opposed to status. Status is out now. Value is in. But what do you do? Do you take your price down? No. What I would say is you change your story to say, this watch is so well, this watch will, your, your grandchildren will love this watch. This is a watch you can pass on to the next generation because it's going to last forever. That's what I mean by, I'd much rather see companies shift their story if they have to, rather than take their price down which tends to undermine you know, the story that you might have built. So prestige products or high value products, uh, you gotta be careful. Once you go down, you ain't going back up. It's, it's, it's very hard. Uh, and you begin to undermine what you stand for. Much better to sort of see if you can construct more of a value story instead of a lower price. Thank you, Mr. Trout. More questions, please? Uh, can I ask to pass the mic? 
And can I actually ask to raise your hands so our ladies with mics will know who is going next? Thank you. My name is Elias, uh, Director of Trans-Eurasian Information Superhighway Project. Um, my question to you is on repositioning. Actually. Repositioning, right. Yes. Uh, you, in your early books, you said that positioning should be changed infrequently. Infrequently, if correct. correct. So if it's good, you don't change it. Don't change it. But now, especially in the high-tech industry that I represent, right. products change very rapidly. Uh, that means that um, you have to somehow change your positioning more frequently. So how do you address that paradox? Um, and how frequently do you believe we should change uh, position or reposition well, in the high-tech industry? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's hard to answer without knowing the specifics of the problem. Uh, but I would say that uh, let's just take history now. Let's take Kodak. Kodak was king of film. Technology comes in digital. Now, guess who invented digital photography? Kodak. But what did they do? They didn't do anything with it because they didn't want to upset the film business. So in a way, what they should have done is they should have said, this could be a big deal. We should launch a new digital brand. But not in, not in Rochester, New York. We'll go out to Silicon Valley. It, we would have to compete with our film business. But that's, if the world is going that way, you sometimes have to be willing to compete with yourself. Because you don't want to miss it. Well, they missed it. And Kodak is now just about gone, or on the verge of going away. So in a way, you've got to look at markets involved. And if, if it's changing and it's evolving in one direction, uh, you have to be willing to go there. Um, the, wa the Walkman, you know, P Sony's Walkman is gone. The iPod, the digital world, overtook that, that whole category, that evaporated on either. They should, have, they should have saw that coming and were willing to attack themselves with the new evolutionary product. It's hard because nobody wants to kill the golden goose. Because, but the future is changing. And you're right, in the high-tech world, very rapidly. So you have to, I think you have to be willing to attack yourself. It happened to Xerox. Laser printer uh, was invented by Xerox. They invented a lot of stuff, but they tried to do it under the Xerox name. No good. They, need, they needed a new brand name. They had to, in a way, compete with themselves. Or, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough world out there. And in the technology world, you can get wiped out with a new technology. So you have to be very prepared to say, it's going to be painful, but we should go there. It's going to, even though it'll impact my, my business. Thank you. More questions? I can see the hand on the back. Yes, please. My name is Rao Falib. I'm uh, an entrepreneur, and I'm representing Azerbaijan Marketing Society. My question is, uh, first, uh, thank you for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, and we saw many countries and uh, the ways of uh, their repositioning. As you know, Azerbaijan is known for its oil and caviar. Oil and gas, yes. And, uh, That's what you're known for. You heard that Azerbaijan it's, uh, would like to position it, it as a touristic country. Right. And a country where people like to live in. What, uh, Tourism? Azerbaijan? Tourism. Tourism. Well, um, I, I, it's hard for me to answer because I haven't really seen your country. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't know. But I do, what you do have, and I'll just say that you have a clean slate. Nobody knows anything about this place. Trust me. You are a clean slate. Uh, now that's, that's good news and bad news. You know, the good news is nobody knows anything about you, so you have a lot to work with. The bad news is nobody comes here. Um, so my view is, it, now's the time to figure it out. If you want to be, if you want to get into the tourism game, which you should, because it's very good money, and it's always good to be in a place where nobody's been, because you can, you can, you know, people love to go to places where nobody's been. You know, in fact, in Soviet era, Azerbaijan used to be a touristic place in, in, in Soviet. Here? Yeah, yeah. It was? One of oh, the... For the Soviets. Yes. Well, one now of we're the... talking about the rest of the world. Yeah. But, so it's an advantage, but the trouble is what you've got to do is look around and see 
what you have that will attract tourists. You've got to, in a way, build a program and say, well, we have this, this, and this. Um, and then you have, to, you have to introduce this country to the world or, or to the markets that you feel that you could attract tourists from. So, I mean, I think, I don't know, I, I'm a, everybody's got something. Uh, uh, unless it's Belarus. I was there, it's terrible. Just big, flat country with nothing of interest. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, uh, it's, it's, yeah, you, can, you, can have a, you, you open up with the Caspian Sea, it's pretty good. It's a good start. But, um, so yeah, I think it's, you got a lot to work with, but you got a big job to do. Thank you, more questions? I can see, yes, yes please. Hi, uh, my name is Farid Ahunov and I'm with PricewaterhouseCoopers Azerbaijan. I have a question. I've read in your bio that you've been working with the U.S. government on branding the country. U.S. government, yes. The U.S. government, right. and actually it was, it was sounded like State branding the country, branding yes. the United States. Right, right. Given that particular background that you have, can you like in three words maybe, or three like slogans or differences describe this country? Like one, two, three, what does make it so different from the rest of the world? What stands behind it? Thank you. I didn't quite get that question. I, I think the question was, what makes it different exactly. what from other different? countries? What you said that you've been advising the government of the United States. You said, and it's said, I mean, it's in Wikipedia and everywhere. So, and I wonder, how did you differentiate the United States from the rest of the world, and what makes it so much different? Oh, That's okay, the well, the U.S. problem was, a, that was work I did for the State Department. And essentially, um, it was much more, not so much introducing what to see in the United States. That was not the, I mean, most people have a pretty good awareness. It's a big place. We can go see, uh, we can go to the, the desert, the Grand Canyon. Uh, our attractions are pretty much a stop. New York City for this guy. I mean, that's not the problem. The problem with the State Department is, is how do we essentially uh, make the rest of the world feel that what we're doing is useful. In other words, it was trying to get, get our diplomatic core repositioned. And I gave them a very interesting strategy, which um, I said, now, what you should stand for are these three things, and I won't get into it all. And I said, these are the three things that you are helping the world be in, in, within the world. And I think these are three things everybody would say, hey, that's pretty good. And, and, and it was so funny, because I did this in a State Department big meeting. And they all say, well, that's a, that is a pretty good, I think that will help our image. But we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? Well, we're about to invade, invade Iraq. I said, that's ridiculous. What are we doing that for? Well, you know, and, and, and that, was, that was a true story. So I said, well, look, if you invade Iraq, forget this program. You know, you're done. Because that just is going to dominate everything. So uh, it was an interesting project. I think it's a project, interesting enough, I could take this project to Obama today, or Hillary Clinton, the State Department, say you should do this, and it would probably work a lot better uh, as a way to kind of enhance our, our image out there, which has been beaten up by you know some of the problems we've had. So yeah, it's a. Uh, but the uh, Iraq look, we had George Bush will go down as one of the worst presidents in the history of our country. Believe me, he was a disaster. Thank you. More questions, yeah. please. Hi. Hi, my name is Shahru. I'm from Baltica. And uh, the question about all the cases you have shown, most of the failures in the line extensions are linked mainly to the, I would say, not emotional but functional benefits of the product. Right. Uh, if the uh, promise, brand promise, is based on emotional benefits, so how far you can, to what extent you can go with the line extension? Because I'm coming from a beer industry, so, and you know, maybe you're familiar, especially in the former USSR markets, it's like going crazy because there is a brand and the new niche, new tasters, and you are always standing before, uh, on the choice going with the line extension or the standalone. I mean, if you go for a standalone brand, then it means new investments, brand building, uh, all, all again and again. So what is your I mean, opinion about it? What, what is about the, line extension? About line extension, and what if the brand, uh, like, like you, you've seen the uh, you show about the toothpaste and the Volvo, 
they have a functional benefits like safety or good taste. Right, bad. right, right, right. And now it's uh, more and more brands going to the emotional benefits. Well, look, let's stop. Let's let's deal with emotional. Yeah. I am not a great fan of emotional advertising. I see it. I, I basically think it's. Uh, you hear a lot about that, and I usually get into arguments with people. I said, emotional, emotion is not a differentiating idea. You know, anybody can do emotional stuff. And one of the biggest problems, well, I'm on my way to India, and I'm working with a big motorcycle company there. And I have a problem. I develop a strategy, and they give it to the agency, and what do they want to do? They want to do Bollywood. Boy meets girl meets motorcycle. In the scooter business, it's girl meets boy meets scooter. And, and that's what goes on. And it's all about people. On, and and, and it's, I'm trying to get them away from that emotional stuff so to get what? something more functional. Now, in beer, yeah, beer can be leadership, you know, number one brand, which you saw with, with Brahma. Uh, uh, beer can be how it's made. And, I, you know, and I, we see some pretty effective stuff on how, how, how the care they take in developing a beer. So I mean, there are. I much rather go there than try to do emotional stuff because a lot of the advertising people they love that emotional stuff. Boy, man, we can do a movie. We can do Bollywood. So when you get into emotion, um, you know, maybe in some cosmetics, uh, that kind of world, you're, you're a little bit more emotional because you know, you're. This is how you're going to attract uh, other people. I don't know. It's but I. I, I, there's very little emotional advertising that I think is, is worth anything, to be honest but with you. If we're coming to the motorcycles, but the biggest brand like Harley Davidson, the Harley Davidson is a, yeah, that's a, that's an icon. Freedom, that's, yeah. This is an emotional benefit. I mean, it's an icon freedom. brand. Yeah. That's what they are. They're, they have this club and they built this thing and it's a, and it, it works well in the United States, but motorcycles in the U.S. are just, you know, hobbies, toys, you know, we cruise. Um, in India, motorcycles are, you know, instead of a car, I can't afford a car, I'll get a motorcycle. So there's much more utilitarian stories that go with motorcycles. So but hey, look, if you can get to icon status with a brand like Harley, sure. But there are very few of those out there, believe me. It's, it's not easy to do. And, and is owning a Harley a, a, an emotional thing? Yes, yeah, sort of, I guess. But it's still a, an, it's an icon. Thank you. More questions? Please, in the second row. My name is Majnun. I'm from Modern Group. Uh, my question is about, uh, you mentioned quite a lot of uh, successful stories in positioning. Was there, in your experience, an unsuccessful story? And um, this is my first question. And the second question, what are the things uh, not to do in the positioning strategy? Uh, what we should not do, definitely. Or are there any common mistakes? You should not do common mistakes? Yeah, what are the common mistakes, generally? Well, um, I, you saw the you saw the common mis the most common mistake is line extension, which you saw the, in the aim toothpaste. Instead of staying with the taste one taste idea, getting into all I different kinds of toothpaste, I think that's a that's line extension is the most common mistake. The second most common mistake people make is letting Wall Street run your business for you, uh, and and and, uh, and it's, it's a, and essentially. If I were to say, what is, in the United States, what is the biggest problem in marketing? It's Wall Street. It's the financial stuff. How do I make more money? Um, and um, and, and they, they do very, they force companies to do really stupid things as a way to, to get more money, supposedly. That's where you lose focus. You get into different brands, you sh things you shouldn't do. Um, it's a very true story. <clears throat> I was asked once by a big drug company to sit in a room where, they, where their people came in and presented their plans for next year. They said, all we want you to do is tell them what you think of their plans. I said, fine. Young, young person comes in, he says, this is my brand, and I have some new competition next year. I said, oh, big competition, whoa. Who's it gonna be, he told me. I said, yeah, it's gonna be tough. And then he said, now, here are my projections, my sales projections, okay. He said, I'm going to have a 15% sales increase. I said, what? You got a new competitor? I would have been impressed if you said, I'm going to do the same number. How'd you get 15%? Well, I'm I said, that's not going to happen. He said, well, don't yell at me. Yell at my boss. 
I said, your boss? Yeah, he made me put that number in there. So I said, oh, okay. So I went to his boss. I said, what are you, that's not a real number. He said, why are you forcing people to sell, think they're gonna sell more than they're gonna sell? He says, don't yell at me, yell at my boss. Said, well, who's that? Well, the CEO, why? Wall Street. They wanted to project, build these numbers that they were gonna impress the financial community. And that is what happens a lot, especially in, in a, where you have companies that are all public. And uh, so I think the biggest mistakes people make are mistakes of lack of focus on what we are, um, greed because we think we can make more money, uh, and, uh, and probably not adjusting to the changing market, which I talked about earlier, where the world, the digital world is impacting on my film world. Um, those are the, the, the basic mistakes uh, that people make. Um, and, you know, I, people that are making banks, which I just talked about, they're the, you know, they're, they, we just saw what they did, the banking world. Um, again, why, why did they do so many bad things that, that wrecked the economy? Greed. And the, the biggest problem in, in America, in the financial world right now, is they're all about I love it, they, they use the word traders. I have traders on the floor. They're not traders, they're gamblers. And they're betting big with other people's money. And if you change that one word and said to the press, don't you call them traders, call them gamblers. That would have a dramatic impact. And you can't let banks become big gamblers because bad things can happen. Um, so, I would say that that is, it's the, it's, the, it's the greed, it's the gambling, it's the lack of focus, it's, it's, it's not staying with what you are, is, is really the, the key, yes, it is, and not being clear as to what you are, staying with it, and just finding a way to improve it, make it better, and, and, and even attack yourself to some degree if you have to. And that's what, that's what, that's the biggest mistakes. Thank Mr. you. Can I ask More questions? Other? Can I? Yes, please. My name is Ruslan Hussainov, marketing department, other cell. Oh, Mr. Trout, we all know that you are uh, author of the notion positioning. Yeah. You institutionalized that, gave, gave it theoretical base. But nowadays we have quite interesting trends happening, socializing, shrinking private life. What will be next? I mean, what, what do you next? think? Yes, what will be next? I have next, no idea. Not next. That's somebody else's problem. Next notion, basic notion. Now, look, in, 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 in football, in our football, not in your football, in, the, is, is essentially what, what the, the best people say is, look, it's all about blocking and tackling. It's the two simple things, blocking and tackling. And if you do that well, you will win more games. Um, yes, they get into some tricky new things, but for the most part, it's the basics. Positioning is fundamental blocking and tackling. It's how do you get into the mind and how do you differentiate? Blocking and tackling. What's next? Uh, I don't know what's next. I mean, I, don't, I think blocking and tackling will be here for a long time. In other words, it's, it's, it's the basics. What I'm talking about is, this, is as I say, the starting point. How do you deal with the social networking and all this other stuff? As I said, it's a work in progress. Nobody knows how to deal with this stuff yet. So these are new tools. Will you have new tools to play with? Right. Can you? How do you do it? How do you, how do you build a brand online? Not easily. I mean, look at, look at BMW. The ultimate driving machine has driven them into really the first place in their category and they've done it for 30 years. Look at, look at all these brands that were built since 1923. Still there, still dominant. Um, so I, 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 to me, I, I got this question in, in uh, Istanbul about what about the millennium generation, these new people. I said, they're gonna have to learn how to block and tackle first. Then they can play with the new tools. So I mean, I think, uh, well, I'm talking about basic stuff. I'm sorry, I think. No, yeah, I lost my thing. 
What I'm talking about today is just basic, basic stuff. And I don't think it's going to change. I think there'll, there'll be new tools, new, new ways to reach people. Uh, but you've got to learn how to, number one, differentiate, and number two, get into the mind. What people don't realize, and, I, and I'll give you a, a little well-known secret, what's positioning? What, what did we do? It's different. What we did was we brought in the science of psychology into market. It's the first book and the only set of books that really deals with the, the human condition, psychology. It's, it is really, and no one, that's what we did. We mixed those two, the science of psychology with the science of marketing. And, and I think that's not going to change. The tools will change, but essentially we're still dealing with human beings. How do we sell them? How do we avoid being ignored? Um, how do we avoid confusing them? Um, and, it's, it's, and, it, and, I, and it's something I talked about in Istanbul. And forget about this question of what, trying to find out what people want. They don't know what they want. Uh, they buy what other people buy is what happens. Generally, that's the, that's the psychology. You talk about Steve Jobs, and that's it. he had exactly the same philosophy. He said, don't, don't, I, will t I will figure out what people want. I don't, need, I don't have to ask them. I know what, I, I know what they're going to want. I'm going to build this elegant, you all mostly are walking around with these phones that he built. Nobody, and, and it goes way back to when plain paper copying was born, Xerox. They did a lot of research. Would you pay 10 cents a copy for this? And everybody said, no. I, I don't want that. Well, they, they, they introduced it anyway, and people looked at it and said, hey, it's worth 10 cents, I'll do it. So in other words, it, it, it's, it's, you gotta be, you're dealing with basic human beings, and they're not going to change. So I, what I'm talking about, I think, is going to be universal. And we, talk, we wrote a book called The Immutable Laws of Marketing. Things don't change. So I'm not concerned about what's going to happen and what's going to replace it. I think it's just basic stuff. Thank you. I think there was some one more question. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Lo Fakhri, Trump Bank, uh, Marketing Department. I want to ask one question. Uh, maybe it's uh, a little bit private, private question. But uh, I want to know about your uh, opinion. Uh, which bank you choose, the big bank, the bank with the higher experience, or the bank with a good uh, promotion, maybe PR? I'm, repeat that again. Uh, my opinion on what? About the which bank, bank you Banks? choose, big bank, or bank with a higher experience, uh, or bank good, with a good promotion? Bank promotions? Yeah, uh, I think the question is, uh, how do you think uh, which bank the customer chooses? The big banks, the banks with the bigger promotions probably, or the banks with more experience? Yes. Is that right? Your personal choice, what it would be. And a bank with experience or a bank with, with, uh, with promotion or a bank with a better experience? Wow. I guess... Uh, I, I think you have to, um, I think it's a combination, to be honest with you. I, th I think it's, A, build a big reputation for the bank. In other words, we've been doing, you know, wh whatever your story is. Um, there's one, there's probably one of the most successful banking stories in America. I didn't, I didn't show it here, I showed it in Istanbul. There was a bank called Commerce Bank. And what did they do? They said, what we're going to do is we're going to build a bank based on service. It, 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 we're going to essentially have a, a, not promotions, but on service, convenience. And they changed a lot of their policies, banking hours. They said, we're going to build it around being the most convenient bank in America to do work. To build. That was very, very successful. They took an attribute, convenience, easy to use, easy to bank with, and they built a whole program around that idea. So I think that's a better way to go. You know, what, do, what, do, what does a banking customer want or need? Can I, and, I, and I've been involved with banks who essentially speed of service, we're gonna be quicker. And they very successful built that idea. Convenience, they built that idea. So in other words, I, I think 
a good bank will, 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 will essentially work on an attribute like that, a service or customer-oriented attribute, and build a brand like that. So which bank are you using? Which bank am I using? Yes. Well, I'm stuck with one in town that's uh, you know, Chase, which is a, a big bank. And, uh, and, and, you know, and it's pretty much based on the fact that they're local and it's good service. Okay, so does it mean that in your personal choice, you don't really use your marketing strategy? So you don't apply them in your personal choices in the daily life? You just stick to the local one, not the one with better customer experience? Or it's a locational thing, basically, and, and there's a certain amount of size that, you know, I don't want to go, I'm not going to go for a little teeny one. Uh, but, uh, so I think financial stability, though that's questionable today with all these people, and um, location is very important. Convenience, I guess, is kind of the why we chose that bank. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? I think I saw. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Trout, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, confronting reality and uh, being uh, within a common sense always. Um, you wrote in your book that uh, there are four principles. And the first one, when you confront reality or trying to analyze the situation, you should uh, get your ego out of the situation. Have you ever failed on doing that? I'm not sure that. Give, give me that again. Um, when you confront reality, analyze the situation, business I, context. I analyze the situation, Yes. Right? First of all, you should get uh, your ego out of the situation. And in this, uh, um, I would say, nowadays, when we have a lot of ego clashes, how, how uh, can you permanently be successful at doing that? Or have you ever failed at doing that? Have I failed? Yes. Yeah, so the question, the question, to make it short and clear, the question is that in any business situation that you wrote, first of all, you have to get out your ego out of it. So how to succeed in this, right? Have you ever failed on doing that in business? How do you get out of it? Yes. Oh, my God. Well, getting out is easy. You get out. I mean, how? How to get out? Yes. Well, I'd have to know more about the problem. No, you've been coping or working, I would say, with a lot of CEOs, yes? Oh, yeah. A lot of big guys. And normally, it means that yeah, they have big egos as well. So how are you, uh, how you trying to make yourself out of the situation in terms of ego clash and how you're uh, facilitating the process of, I mean, getting them out of the situation? Getting them out of the situation? Yes. How you do that? Oh, well, all right, let's, let's... I, I know this goddamn I, 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 difficult let question, you, yes. Let me give you a true story, which is really what I'm involved with in India. Okay. India has a, there's a big, there's a big uh, family company, a family group. In, 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 in Korea, they call them chai bowls, but it's a family group, and they have a motorcycle business, they have a, a finance, uh, an insurance business, they have electrical products business. They have a bunch of family businesses. The problem is they have, they put the, they, they, they put the same name on all these businesses. The family's called Bajaj. And I'm working with the motorcycle business, okay? Now, this gentleman who is the, the mate patriarch of this family has two sons. The oldest son is running the motorcycle business. The younger son is running, helping run the, the uh, insurance business. The problem, this is the getting out problem. The problem is I, they should not use the Bajaj name on, only business they should use it on is the motorcycle business. That's the biggest, most successful business. That's the brand that they should be focused on. And it's become a gigantic fight between the, you know, the, the son who's running motorcycles, he wants the rest of the family to not use his brand name, Bajaj. He says it belongs on my business. We should, we should essentially rebrand the other businesses. For example, insurance, they're, they relate, they're connected with Allianz, big insurance company. They call it Bajaj Allianz. Big mistake. It should just be Allianz India. That's it. So your question is, how do you get them out of it? The answer is with great difficulty. I, I fight, I, I went to the, the father, I said, this is what you should do. I went to the board of directors of his group and I said, you should, you, you should have your own names, you should leave Bajaj on the motorcycle brand. 
So the best you can do is try to argue them out of what they're doing. And the way you do this is by, by saying, look, the world is changing. You know, going forward, you're going to have more competition. And the way to get, you should build stronger brands in your other businesses. And that's the, that's, and, and, and it's not easy. Because when you're into names and family names, you're into a lot of ego. Yes. Uh, you're into this, this clash between the sons. The motorcycle son is, doesn't get along with his father. As I told, and I said this to them all, I said, you know, you have two sons. One plays you like a violin. The other one plays you like a drum. <laughs> and the drum is just constantly beating. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting. So getting things undone, and I, and I guess to answer your question in the simplest terms, the best strategy I have found when somebody's making a mistake and you're trying to get them off the mistake is you don't challenge them and say, that's stupid, that doesn't work. <clears throat> what you do is you show them an analogy and say, now, this is what happened to this company. Similar story. And, and it, it, they did this and it went crash. So I'm not saying it's going to happen to you, but it could. So in other words, you, you, you try to draw a parallel with a similar situation and say, now, this had a not ha did not have a happy ending. And this, so in a way, you might want to think about that. That's the best you can do in, in undoing stuff, um, is use a, a, a parallel or an analogy. But it's, it's, it's never easy. Okay. And I don't always have success either. Thank you. I have another question about, um, I know that you have 14 uh, children. Grand 14 grandchildren. Yes. yes. Great. Grandchildren. Uh, what, what's your positioning strategy as, as a grandfather in your as family? As a grandfather? What's my yes. positioning strategy? Stay out of the way. <laughs> uh, what you cannot do is do a lot of critiquing of the parenting skills of my children. That's, yeah, yeah, and Does it work? No, it doesn't work. They, they get upset. Um, and I, I, I'll make, I'll say, you know, I don't think you're doing this well, but you know, you have to figure, look, it's their children, and, and they're going to have to work it out themselves. You might give them a little advice, but you'll know it's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mr. Trout. Uh, my name is Nigar. I'm from Other Cell Corporate Communication. I can imagine how the life of a customer is hard for you, because you know everything about marketing tricks. And I just wonder, uh, how do you choose the products? Do you believe in uh, positioning uh, words, everything, what you're just were, uh, were talking uh, about, or uh, you just believe in quality? And uh, do you believe in brand, or you believe uh, in your on your in your own experience? Oh, well, oh. I guess what, what what are you trying to get to? My philosophy on. Yes, I mean, how yes. do you choose products and services? How do you choose the products in your life? Do you believe in brands or you choose them based on some promotion ideas or well, I, you believe in quality? I, I don't think I'm any... I basically will pretty much choose brands on, um, on how well they position themselves in my mind. I mean, it's, what I preach is essentially, you know, pretty much how it works. Um, <clears throat> I... Um, I will buy, I will shave with a Gillette blade. I'm not going to go for any promotional cheapo blade. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to go to the next generation. They now have a blade that's got five blades. That's too many blades. I cannot get it under my nose in number five. So I, I've stopped at three. Uh, so in a way, you, you make your own considerations and you don't go for, for everything. And, and in automobiles, you know, you, uh, um, what do I drive? Well, I, I, I'm a great believer in the Prius, which is the, the hybrid, electric, because um, I think that's the future, so I got one of those, and that's, you know, 45 miles to the gallon, which is great. And I bought a, I bought a Lexus because of, the, the, I think, their, their reliability. So, um, you know, I own two Toyotas, the fancy one and the an electric one. Um, but I, I would say I am just as susceptible to positioning, and I mean, I had a BMW because I like their, their driving idea. So I'm probably a standard consumer. I mean, I, I, uh, and my wife buys most of the stuff anyway, so, you know, <laughs> I don't have to deal with a lot of it. Um, I have a question. I know that you're not a great fan of social networks, is that right? So how, how as one of the greatest marketing strategists, 
who owns 40 years experience uh, cannot believe in the reality because it is the reality and we all now are all the people I mean if to ask to raise hands who doesn't have Facebook account I think probably there will be only few of them in the in the audience at least so how do you think the marketing people would work without social networks because because I think that this is the greatest marketing and PR tool of, of the new century well, I don't know I don't I think I've said that earlier it's social networks are, it's a new tool now my own personal feelings about so they're a waste of time it's narcissism taking to a whole nother level I don't care what people are doing in their life very much um, and I and I and I've said this to my grandchildren I said look you're in an age teenagers where you do stupid things teenagers do stupid things I said what you don't want to do is do stupid things in front of the world which is what's happened when you put the stuff on Facebook because it hangs around it never goes away um, so I'm I and, and so they're all addicted and I yell at them I don't yell at them I sort of try to say why don't we read a good book but it, it's hard it's it's become a it's a it's a it's a very addictive thing and um, um, my view is from a marketing point of view it's a tool um, but the, it's a it's a it's a it's a very difficult tool for example people want to get into tweeting and reading stuff and what I just what you people are discovering is people will say good things about you and they'll say bad things about you sometimes the bad things come from not guess where competitors a competitor makes believe he's you know he's a person and he starts tweeting bad things about what's going on in the company. In other words as I, and, and I've said this to my children I said the internet you can understand it's a sewer it has to be very carefully filtered and screened because there's a lot of bad stuff on that floating around and in the marketing world same thing it's you got to be careful it's a tool but it, it's messy it, it's hard to use to my knowledge I don't know how you build a brand there it's very hard um, how do I build the ultimate driving machine? You can't. So it's you got to view it as a tool. It's not the answer. And I and getting your kids off of it is a believe me. It'd be nice if you could do get them use less of it because it is a I, I see it as nothing but you know not very useful. Uh, I would disagree a bit. I'm sorry because I think that. Um, even using those stupid things that any children or anybody in the Facebook would do will help the companies to use those stupid things to sell them the product so from business point of view I believe that it is very useful to know what the people are doing in the social networks because it helps us as web companies to sell what we want to exactly the people the target audiences we want and we choose so what you're saying is it's a tool that's fine I don't I recognize that I am not against it as a tool, but you have to figure out how to use it. BMW, I remember they tried to, they had little driving episodes online with Facebook and they were using stuff like that. They had, you know, they took like little mini driving movies. Sure, you can try that. They've stopped it. I think it got very expensive and I don't think they saw the value in it. But every company has to look at it and say, how do we use it? Let me give you the numbers. This will tell you something. <coughs> Right now, the last numbers I saw in the United States, marketing budgets, money spent on marketing, 90% of the money is going into traditional media. 90% is still communicating in television, radio, newspapers, magazines, direct, whatever it is, traditional stuff, 90%. 10% is going into your, your on, online internet, the new media. Based, you know, social networking, etc. So what's happening is they're, they're they're exploring. They're saying, how can we use it? What can we do with it? How do we build? Can we can we enhance our marketing activities online? So, but it's still it's still a work in progress. It's it, there are no easy answers yet. It's not like the traditional media. So I, I'm my point to marketers is be careful. I mean, try it. If you can learn something from it. Terrific, um, you know. Maybe it's a it's a it's a real tool for what you're trying to do. And get your damn kids off of it. <laughs> That's my motto.
Okay. Okay, thank you. I think probably we'll take a couple of last questions, one more in the back, and then we'll have one in the front. Hi, my name is Tatiana Mikhailova, and I'm the director for Max Media Advertising Agency. First of all, Mr. Trout, um, you would agree with me, I would like to thank our colleagues as ourselves for creating such a great event and inviting you here, actually, which, had, uh, which is a good opportunity for us to, <laughs> to interact with you. And uh, my question is actually a rather personal, but personal question. Okay. fully based on your professional background. All right. Do you believe in God? Do I believe in God? Do you believe in God? Yeah, yeah, I'm not an atheist. Yeah. Why? Why? Yes. <laughs> Probably God promotes himself or herself very good. That's why he believes in it. Why do I believe in God? <sighs> well, I don't know. I guess I've been trained over all these years. You know, to believe. I mean, it's, it's, if you start that way, it's, um, um, let's just, well, let's not get, it's a tough subject. I mean, we could talk. It is tough. I do understand it. <laughs> yeah, we, we could spend a day talking about that. I, um, yeah, but the answer is, I'm not an atheist. Yeah, so I do. Okay, how do I get there? Well, it's just been years and years and years. It's a habit. Go ahead. What else? So you do? Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one question in here. Uh, my name is Gulnar. I'm director of sales and marketing parking by Redison Hotel. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. There was two points which I want to direct your attention to. And the first one about the beer. The beer. You remember number one, which was obviously number two. And the second one, the story about Mr. Martinez, who obviously became yeah, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Robert M. Taylor. Yes, right. So it was kind of exaggerating, let's say or even lying to customers. So do you believe in marketing without lying to customers? So do you believe in lying? Do I believe in lying? Oh, well, no, no, you can't. What, what's interesting is that a lot of it is where, 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 you're, where you happen to be living. Lying is very difficult to get away with in the United States. Uh, you have to... Uh, very, people very quickly jump on all, anything that's you know, misrepresented and they make a big thing out of it and next thing you know you've got lawyers and whatnot. So in, in Brazil they were evidently to, a little looser. China, you can't even mention your leadership or customers. It's very hard. Uh, I say, well here's what you should say and we can't say that. So no, I, I think you have to be accurate. Uh, so I, you, to me lying only, it's not going to uh, Generally speaking, it's, it's not a long-term strategy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. So what's your other question? Uh, but do you believe that marketing is about manipulating with people's mind? Marketing is about? Manipulating. Manipulating. No, no. Mark, as I said, marketing is good storytelling. What's your story? Why should I buy your product instead of somebody else's product? And, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. Why should I vote for this president? instead of the other guy who's running against them. Um, you know, and so in a way, it's, it's how do you tell your story versus your competition. A marketing program is essentially built around that story and why you should be bought instead of your competitors. That's really the essence of, of marketing. And it is developing a, a good story and figuring out what tools you have to get your story out, whether it's online, whether, whatever it is. So that's what marketing is all about in its simplest format. Thank you. I think, um, I think we're running out of time. Um, I want to thank Mr. Trout again. And um, I think if to summarize, um, we have learned today a lot um, about what marketing strategy really is. And probably what we learned about some personal stuff about Mr. Jack Trout, that he's grandfather more than once. He uses local bank. He uses Gillette with three raises. So is that enough to send him a friend request? Well, yes, he doesn't have a social network account, right? So, so um, I would like really to thank uh, Mr. Trout for accepting our invitation, coming all over to Baku, uh, sharing his knowledge and experience with all of us. Thank you. I want to thank a lot our president, Mr. Ali Agan, who actually initiated it, our great marketing team, Christina, Sabri, Ruslan, everyone who worked on this. I want to thank you, Barish Bay, for uh, putting it all together. 
I want to thank all of you, all Azerbaijan business community and marketing society who made it for today for great questions, for great answers. And I do hope, Mr. Trout, that at least from now on you will know where Azerbaijan is. And you would be a word of mouth, which I want to believe you believe in, right? I will, I will always remember this is the place I got a purple tie. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you.